Upashna, I'll be right back in like one minute. We have people joining in. So in one minute, I'm coming back. आप पर्टिकुलर पॉइंट्स के लिए फ्रेश था जो भी जेलसी है वो हमारे मैरिज से आपका मैरिज भी गिरा है तो वो बता रहा है बहुत सी ओपन में जाए तो वी कैन ओपन प्रोडिगल सनराइज ओके हाय हेलो पाशना आर यू देयर यस सर ओके सो शुड वी वेट फॉर सम टाइम और स्टार्ट is we ha still have 1 minutes to 1 minute to yes go. sir 1 okay, minute we, to go yeah let's wait huh? and the screen is visible to all of you right the full screen yes sir it is visible it is visible okay great
So there are 52 till now. We can yeah. start, I think. We can start, actually, yeah. Yes, sir, it is 7.05. Yeah, it's 7.05, yeah. Good, good evening, all of you. So today, uh, Sambit sir will talk on neuropath neuropathology. He is an eminent person uh, who has done a lot of work on neurothelial neoplasms. So we will listen from them today how to approach the different lesions of bladder and related organs. Okay, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Pashna, and the rest of the team uh, for inviting me over. So what we are going to do in the next hour and a half or two hours, how to approach uh, the various specimens from the bladder, particularly the bladder biopsy and the transurethral specimens, and uh, how to interpret the findings. So what I, my talk would be basically outlined on the normal histology of the urothelial mucosa, the various inflammatory lesions, infectious diseases, metaplastic and hyperplastic conditions, polyps, non-neoplastic benign lesions, then the flat lesions of the bladder and the urothelial tract. When I talk about urothelial tract, I basically start from the pelvis of the kidney to the penile urethra. And various urothelial neoplasms or the cancers. So what are the tools uh, we basically, before we get into a pathology of the bladder or the urothelial tract, what are the various tools we have 
in an armamentarium to study the bladder pathology. <clears throat> One of the clinical. Clinically, most of the patients are present with either a painless or a painful hematuria or pyuria or just a smoky urine. And then urine cytology is the first tool to kind of get into that. We do have various amazing techniques like uh, radiology and CT scan. And PET-CT doesn't really come in the initial workup. Then the cystoscopic evaluation is the most important thing, followed by your biopsy. And molecular markers are coming up. I'll talk, to, talk about that in a little bit. So when is a bladder biopsy performed? The most important indication of a bladder biopsy is when there is painless immaturia and there is a mass in the bladder. The urologist went into the inside the bladder by the cystoscope and he or she finds a mass. So that mass lesion in the bladder is the most common indication of a bladder biopsy. Sometimes they also see erythematous areas or very, very white areas. If it is completely white or it is red, those are areas suspicious for a carcinoma in situ, they should be biopsied. Or there is a positive urine cytology. When I talk about, say, biopsy, that means it is, they get chased after the mass. It is basically a transurethral resection of the bladder. So, so they went through the penile urethra or to the female urethra, in case of female, and they <coughs> take the mass out in one container, uh, whatever they can, and they do a deep muscle biopsy as well in another container. What are the indications of doing a second TURBT or a second transurethral section of the bladder tumor. According to the European guidelines and the NCCN guideline, it should be performed about two to six weeks after the initial biopsy or the TURBT in the following situations. If the urologist think he or she has done an incomplete resection, they go for a TURBT. If there is no muscle present in the specimen, in the initial resection, when they are thinking of a high-grade lesion, except for TA, if it is a uh, lesion, if it, the cancer is confined to the basement membrane, is a low-grade lesion, then they probably would not go for a repeat TURBT. But if it is a T1 lesion, regardless of the grade, low or high grade, if it is a T1 lesion, if there is carcinoma in situ, they possibly get into the bladder again to go for TURBT because CIS is a high-grade lesion. The CIS in bladder is not like C the CIN. When we have CIS, CIS gives rise to a high-grade bladder cancer. CIS never gives rise to a low-grade bladder cancer. And sometimes you get a report when it says low-grade muscle invasive, that means low-grade muscle invasive cancers, they do not exist. They are basically high-grade tumor. And if you have a low-grade T1 tumor and muscle is not available for examination, a repeat TURBT is recommended because there is almost always a chance of being a high-grade lesion because T1 low-grade lesions are rare and uh, the muscle status should be known to the urologist. Why? If it is a muscle-invasive bladder cancer, it is a candidate for cystectomy. And now the things are evolving. So these patients can be put into new adjuvant chemo radiation followed by a cystectomy if there is no response. In all high-grade tumor except for primary CIS, it may be beneficial to attempt another repeat TURB2 to, to completely get rid of the TUR, the CIS. Any question on this slide? Uh, you can unmute because this is a difficult and a, a lot of things are there. So I want more participation from the house. Any question on this? Okay, if there's no more question, we'll get to the next slide. So when we get into the urinary bladder histology, the first thing I just want to emphasize on there is nothing called transitional epithelium. The word transitional epithelium is obsolete now because the epithelium which is line, uh, lining the bladder is urothelium. It is normally less than seven cell thick. It has multiple layers of cells, so it is pseudostatified. And 
it has various layers of cells. So the term urothelium should be used when you say traditional cell carcinoma. If Haman is saying traditional cell carcinoma, please correct that person and say it is urothelial carcinoma. And in bladder, the beauty of bladder cancer is bladder cancer can be non-invasive by the concepts in the neoplas in the neo the concept of neoplasia. When you see something is invasive. Then we call it is cancer. But in bladder, that doesn't really hold good. In bladder, low-grade bladder cancer, which is non-muscle invasive and non-basement membrane invasive, confined to the epithelium, which is a TA lesion, does exist. So in the bladder, we have the when we start, talk about urothelium, there are two layers. One is a superficial layer, I'll get into the pictures, and which are basically made up of the umbrella cells and the basal and the intermediate layers. So if the bladder, which is distended, the layering is between three to six layers. And in a contracted state, it's be between six to eight la layers. And the typical bladder biopsy or TURBT, what you see is a five layer epithelium. And in the wall, we have the lamina propria or the lamina propria, which has thin, irregular, wispy bundles of smooth muscle, which is called the muscular is mucousy. And we have the muscular is propria, which are thick bundles of muscle, which are made basically the detrusor muscles. So if you go into this, if you see this diagram, this cotton, what you see these polyhedral cells, which are like an umbrella protecting the bladder and these cells, they express uroplakin. And they are basically facet like cells of superficial cells. They are polarized. They can be multinucleated or binucleated in a normal state. And they are the largest cells. You do see ATP in the umbrella cell in normal bladder biopsies. So you have to have that into uh, consideration. And the ATP, what you see in the umbrella cell, there is no increase in the nucleocytoplasmic ratio. What you see, the nucleus is enlarged with a prominent nucleolus. And every cell will look like as if they belong to the same family, like a school of fish appearance. The intermediate and the basal layers, if you see these groups, Presence of groove in the bladder pathology signifies benignity. If you see intranuclear inclusion and grooving, that means we are dealing probably with a benign bladder lesion. And so they are, again, um, pear-shaped cells or can be pariform, and they are mononucleated cells. Either they are elongated like this or they are perfectly round. Then we have a basement membrane. Below the basement membrane, the lamina propria has a lot of vessels. They are mostly thin wall vessels, not the thick wall vessels, and they contain muscular is mucosy. And adipocytes are present at the junction of the external muscle layer, which is the muscular is propria and lamina propria. Usually the lamina propria of the bladder is devoid of adipocytes. Then, and you have a lot of adipocytes in the perivesicular adipose tissue. This is like a very simple, simplified cotton showing the bladder wall. In unfilled bladder, the cells can be cuboidal. In a filled bladder, they can look squamous because the urine is pushing on the epithelium and making them more and more flat. So this is the normal histology. If you see, this is the umbrella cell here. The nuclear membrane is irregular. The envelope is irregular. There is a lot of this chromatin specks. And, but if you see, the basement membrane is making kind of a uh, very thick rim of eosinophilic substance, then these are your normally polarized cells, which are oval to round to elongated in making the basal and the intermediate cells. And if you see, you can see these lovely groups and small nucleolus, but every cell, they look very alike and there is polarized arrangement or they are arranged perpendicular to the basement membrane and they have distinct cell boundaries. Sometimes what happens in the intermediate cell, as you see here, the cells in a normal state could show some syncytia, like the cells are all together without distinct cytoplasmic envelope, which is well known in a normal bladder, but the <clears throat> thickness is again less than seven layer. And this is the lamina propria, which is made up of loose connective tissue. So myofibroblast, fibroblast, inflammatory cells are normally present and thin wall capillaries. And these umbrella cells are positive for CK20 and uroplakin 2. They are negative for KI67, do not be positive in this. They're negative for TP53 and 
In if in this you do an addison molecule staining like CD44, everything would be positive for addison molecule, and P53 would be present at the basal layer along with keratin, <clears throat> along with Ki67, and keratin 20 will outlier this area. And if you remember, if you look at the size of this nuclear and the size of the lymphocytes, they're about 1.5 to 2 times the size of the lymphocytes, which is important because in carcinoma situ of the bladder, the size of the cells would be about 4 to 6 times of the normal lymphocytes in the lamina propria, and they have a very hypochromatic to smudgy nucleus. But do not, if you look at cells like this, this is the umbrella cell. So do not consider it into a CIS cell. Then the basics for interpretation of a tissue biopsy. Any tissue biopsy, when you look at, we look for changes in the epithelium and the subepithelial connective tissue and the basement membrane. So if you see this, every cell look alike, but the thickness is increased. That is hyperplasia. And this is normal. When you talk about loss of polarity, that means there is appearance of a nucleolus, the nuclear membrane becomes irregular, and the nuclear size and shapes are different. So that is basically an isonucleosis that can be supported by an isokaryosis when there is in differences in the chromatin texture. Then you have something when the cells they try to get out of the basement membrane that becomes a malignancy or a carcinoma. Then you look for the inflammatory cells. Is it the neutrophils, eosinophils, lymphocyte, plasma cell, or multinucleated giant cells? So in urinary bladder, in a real-time photograph, you will see this is the urothelium, the based on the basement membrane. Then this exact, this the span, this is spanning the lamina propria. If you see this small muscle bundle, these are small, irregular, thin, and wisps up muscle fiber which are present in the lamina propria just at the level of the blood vessel signifying this is muscular is mucousy and no stain in this wall no immunostain differentiate a muscular is propria from muscular is mucousy just remember in bladder pathology we probably use the minimum number of immunostains as compared to kidney prostate and any other GU organs this is all morphology and if you see these are all clogged blood vessels with lymphocytes and RBCs here and this is a thick discontinuous so the terminology for and if you see there is virtually no fat a little bit of fat here so muscular is propria the detrusor muscle they're thick bundles of muscle they have this sarc sarcolemal nuclei they are discontinuous and they are they are at a place where the vessels are usually thick wall and you have a lot of adipocyte this is the way you differentiate muscular is mucousy or the lamina propria muscle from the detrusor muscle, which is a very important therapeutic and prognostic importance. Then comes, this is the muscularis propria here, the thick bundles, and this is the tumor cells which are infiltrating. And if you come here, presence of fat cells in the muscularis propria is another indicator. When you see a lot of fat cell, sometimes what happens in the 2RBT, you have a lot of tumor, a lot and lot of tumor. And the tumor has almost chewed off all the muscle of the bladder wall. So what you see, you see these high-grade muscle cells and a lot of fat. And it is very, and some um, ribbons of this muscle. So it is very difficult to say what what is it is it a so the first first thing you would pick up your phone and call a urologist what is the size of the tumor is it a sessile lesion or a pedunculated lesion and if it is a sessile lesion is it broad based infiltrating into the bladder wall or not because you will get the answer the urologist said it's the broad based mass which is infiltrating the bladder wall it is not the pedunculated superficial like a low grade tumor you know it is a high grade muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma, what you write in the comment, the tumor is extensive and is high grade in histology, infiltrating um, the, the bladder wall with presence of abundant adipocytes signifying muscular is proper um, invasion. However, typical detrusor muscle bundle is not identified. Therefore, a cystoscopic imaging and clinical evaluation is necessary for further management because MRI is a very good tool for them to find out or this will call for a repeat URBT of the base to see the muscle invasion. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. Okay. Is it all clear? 
uh, I mean, you can stop me if there is a question. Okay. So then, in what is Eurakus? So you know, Eurakus is something. It is. Uh, who can tell me what is Eurakus? We have a lot of youngsters just out of medical school and doing their residency. Can somebody tell me what is Eurakus? One of the students. One of the residents. What is Eurakus? Anyone? Sir, it's a remnant of a channel between the bladder and the umbilicus. Yes, very good. Brilliant. So it is a remnant of a ch channel between the, bla the anterior bladder wall to the umbilicus. And this was, uh, the uracus is patent in the fetal stage. And it becomes the anterior longitudinal ligament in, in adult, when the baby is born. So that's uracus. Sometimes the uracal remnants are present. So what is basically uracus? It is a joining link from the anterior bladder wall or the dome of the bladder to the umbilicus. And what you see, you see this loose connective tissue, some muscle, muscle and this duct-like structures, glandular structure, duct-like structure, which are lined by urothelium. Some of, sometimes what happens, you do see goblet cells within this. They look like goblet cell and urothelial cell. So... Um, and uracus is an area which may undergo neoplastic transformation to uracal carcinoma. So in uracal carcinoma, what they basically do, they do umbilectomy, they cut the umbilicus, then they cut the entire urothelial tract and the dome of the bladder, including the uh, topmost part, portion of the bladder. And that is basically a partial cystectomy with umbilectomy and excision of the entire uracal tract. And when you do grossing, the most important thing is we have that flap of bladder. The margin of the flap is very important to say the tumor has gotten into the bladder or is just confined to the uracal tract. They do. So sometimes majority of the time, the urothelial carcinomas of high grade, they can have a colonic carcinoma morphology type adenocarcinomas also. So it is very important to have that mind when you deal with adeno when you have we have an adenocarcinoma in the two RBT chips. Your first question to your oncolo oncologist or the urologist is: Is it from the lateral wall, anterior posterior wall, or the topmost part of the bladder? If it is from the topmost part of the bladder, you always have uracus in mind and talk to them whether the uracal tract is patent or not. Then comes ectopic prostatic tissue. We do have prostatic ducts and asini, and they saw a lot of crib reforming, giving it um, a very confusing look of an adenocarcinoma or prominent squamous metaplasia. But remember, in prostate, the cells are very, very monomorphic, and they have this clear to light eosinophilic cytoplasm, which will differentiate it from the urothelium. urothelium. Then inflammatory and infectious con conditions. So... One thing we do encounter with the history of allergy or following a TURBT. In second TURBT sample, you do see this lesion, which is called an eosinophilic cystitis. Then parasites, you should look for parasite topical agents on any drug which causes eosinophilia. Then follicular cystitis. 40% of patients with carcinoma of the bladder and 35% of UTI patients, they saw this reactive lymphoid follicles at germinal center and they're present mostly in the lamina propria and push some time pushing the urothelium like evident here at the differential here is a lymphoma if it if the germinal centers are absent you see very monomorphic lymphoid cells and the presence in seeds please work it up to rule out a lymphoma because in elderly age group a CLL and can exist um, with an indolent thing. There's nothing happening, but the, there's, they can form nodule and a plasma cytoma. Then you can have encrusted inflammation of the bladder or encrusted cystitis. What is it? This urea splitting protease group of gram-negative organism, they tend to make the urine alkaline and deposit calcium salts on the injured epithelium. We may or may not find the bacilli, but what you see, you see denuded out epithelium with a lot of calcium oxalate crystal. 
Then you have this hemorrhagic cystitis. So hemorrhagic cystitis is one thing we see in two different conditions. One is history of radiation. You see fibrin and hemorrhage with, and there is no neutrophil. Just remember here, there is absolutely no neutrophil, very few sprinkling of neutrophil, mostly congested vessel, fibrin and hemorrhage, and they're kind of wiping up the urothelium, which is normal in thickness. No cytologic ATP, maybe some reactive change would be there. True ulcerations is not actually present because the neutrophilic infiltrate is low. And it is usually seen following radiation or cyclophosphamide or busulfan toxicity. Then comes your papillary or polypoid cystitis. Papillary or polypoid cystitis. A bulla cystitis. So what do you see? The name is papillary and polypoid. Polypoid is more of a chronic process, which is basically a papillary cystitis. And pap this is basically a papillary cystitis where the lining is either thinned out or normal with edema and vascular proliferation and no ATP in the lining. And papillary, you will have a fibrovascular core. There is a fibrovascular core with normal thickness. Then this is another example of papillary cystitis and the differential would be a low grade papillary urothelial carcinoma history of catheterization for stones or stricture is usually there in such conditions and also what you see you do see reactive squamous metaplastic change then granulomatocystitis so when you see granuloma in a bladder you look for whether the granulomas have necrosis or not so it can be most common instance is a post TURBT or the post BCG setting. Either it is because of post BCG or post TURBT. Second is a tuberculosis, suture granulomas, histocytic reaction to the suture. Then um, for non-invasive urothelial carcinoma, which is a non-muscle non invasive uh, urothelial carcinoma, BCG is a treatment first should be given BCG. So in those cases, post-BCG, you do see granulomas and cystosomiasis. So here you see these non-necrotizing granulomas with epithelial histiocyte, and these are the suture material um, eaten up by the giant cells, a lot of suture material. And there is necrosis here. Then infiltration. This is the case of follicular thyroid carcinoma infiltrating into the bladder wall. You see these thyroid follicles with secretion. These are lymphoid follicles. Then this is a granulomatous reaction. Then cystosomiasis. Cystosomiasis or cystosoma hematobium. It mostly is in Egypt and in South America. You see this lateral spine containing organism surrounded by a lot of eosinophilic response and squamous metaplasia of the lining. And there's a risk of developing bladder squamous cell carcinoma following cystosoma infection. They first undergo a keratinizing squamous metaplasia dysplasia to a cancer. Then viral cystitis. Viral cystitis is the most common is a polymovirus cystitis post-transplantation. So what are these cells? Any one of you, what are these cells with this irregular nuclear membrane? Very, very hypochromatic to smudgy nucleus. And the main thing is their nuclear membrane is kind of getting fragmented. So what are these cells of a BK polymovirus cystitis? Anyone? On the top layer. They're present in the top layer with denuded epithelium. And if you see here, they simulate a carcinoma in situ cells, but the size is not that big. And the nuclear chromatin is fragmenting with disruption of the nuclear membrane. So what are these cells called in urine cytol? They are called? Decoy cells. Decoy cells, yes. Why they are called decoy cells? They are actually non-neoplastic, but they simulate neoplastic cells. And what are these cells? This is another case of viral cystitis. What are these cells? If you see this, these cells have a very hollowed out nucleus with a, an irregular nuclear membrane. And there are some thread-like structures getting out of the nuclear membrane and get going to the cytoplasmic membrane. So what are these cells? And this is a papilloma-like leaf. And with a lot of cytoplasmic clearing, with a fibrovascular core, more of a vascular core. So what is this? 
This is HPV infected cells. So it's a condyloma. It is a condyloma acuminata and an HPV induced cystitis, which is seen in genital herpes and in immunocompromised state. And how about this? This has a big cytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion, a nuclear inclusion, which is also red. This is the cytomegalovirus cystitis. And in cytomegalovirus, these endothelial cells, the vascular endoth the three vascular endothelial cells, which are which have undergone cytomegaly and nucleomegaly with intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions. They also affect the fibroblast. So this is cytomegalic inclusion and they do not affect the epithelial cell to begin with. They affect the endothelial cell and the fibroblast. Then this is malacoplakia. So what is this structure in malacoplakia? So you see these histiocytes, which are basically having pink to partially pink to partially evacuated cytoplasm, a lot of plasma cell and some mitosis. So what are these structures? Anybody? What are these structures? You do see malacoplakia in various organs like gallbladder, urinary bladder, appendix. Virtually it is described in any organ system now. So it is a histiocytic lesion and um, these histiocytes are called von Hansenmann histiocytes. And what are these structures? These are Michaelis Gutman body or MG body. If you do a calcium stain with von Cossa, they will light up and they're iron stain positive as well. And this is a janthogranulomatous cystitis. Like any janthogranulomatous inflammation, you have foamy big histiocytes and the pink histiocytes are malacoplakia without your Michaelis Gutman body and they have a lot of debris within them and they sometimes so erythro and hemophagocytosis. It is seen in association with low-grade urothelial carcinoma and recurrent UTI. Then comes Okay, so what is happening in this? If you see this at a very casual look what you see, you see there is some denudation of the lining and the lot of nuclei. I mean, the urothelial li layering is actually not evident. What you see? Huh. So if you see here, you have these multi-layered cells. The cells are like if. What is very, very evident here, the lining, the cell layer thickness is not increased. They are like all probably five, four, five, six layers. But what do you see? You have this, abruptly, you have these bigger cells which are coming in between the normal urothelium and they do have a syncytia with a cell-free zone, a just cytoplasm and some intracytoplasmic, like the way you see in skin, the respongiosis or intra epithelial edema. Just below this, you see congested vessels and a lot of fibrin strands going with myxoidsin and edema. There's another area which is showing this giant cell reaction, squamous metaplasia of the lining and maybe keratin sometime. And the stroma has a lot of these bizarre cells with elongated nuclei. They look like some, they look like some plastic lyomyoma with a lot of pinkness to the cytoplasm irregular nuclear ah. membrane, holes within the chromatina. And so these are all the features of a radius and cystitis where you see pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia, nest and cords of urothelial cell extending the lamina propria, mimicking invasion. Then you have nuclear ATP, a prominent nucleoli, mitotic figures adding to the confusion. And what do you see basically focus into this area? So if you have this thing for the training, if you have this thing in your mind, syncytial change, cell-free zone, edema, dropping up of the nuclei, irregularity of the nuclear chromatin, but the cells have a similar hypochromatic nucleus, a lot of fibrin edema and myxoid change along with foci of pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia and this reactive myofibroblast. Think about Talk to your clinician about a history of radiation. Then urothelial metaplasia and the hyperplasia. So what is metaplasia for any of the first year resident? What is metaplasia?
replacement of one type of epithelial cell by other type. Just epithelial or mesenchymal also? Mesenchymal also. Yeah, so a mesenchymal cell or epithelial cell getting into another, but they should be matured and Mature. adult type. An adult type, yes. So something we know about VVNs are the von Bruns nest. So what are von Bruns nests? Von Bruns nests are basically bladder diverticulum. But they do not go that far into the muscle. Sometimes they become very, very florid, but they confine most to the lamina propria. It is a reactive process and is identified in 85 to 90 percent of the bladders. Mostly they are seen in the trigon area. And they are solid nest of urothelial cells. Just remember one thing. Von Bruns nest hyperplasia is a very strong mimic of nested variant of urothelial carcinoma. Whereas nested variant of urothelial carcinoma is infiltrated by the architecture, but they did not show cytologic ATP. Whereas in Von Bruns nest, if you see the periphery, the cells are more elongated and the center, they are more cuboidal or polyhedral. So ATP is normally present in Von Bruns nest, whereas ATP is absent in deceptively bland looking nested variant of urothelial carcinoma. I should not use the word variant, it is absolute now, nested subtype of urothelial carcinoma. We only use variant if it is molecularly characterized. And it is situated in the superficial lamina propria, may or may not be connected to the urothelium. And they usually have holes within this, which is called cystitis. If they're bigger, it becomes cystitis, cystica glandularis. If they undergo intestinal metaplasia, that becomes et intestinalis. What is the beauty of this? Sometimes the CIS within the epithelium may extend into the Von Bruns nest. So that is something you need to look into, but that does not qualify for Invasion, it is just CIS, which has extended into the von Bruns nest, is the morphologic variable, just a morphologic variable. So this is what? This is a von Bruns nest or this is nested variant of urothelial carcinoma? Nested Nested variant. Why? So because of the architecture. Yes. No. What about the nucleus? Look into the nucleus. You see a lot of pseudo inclusion, right? Yes. When you von see lot von von rest, I think. Yes. These are one rooms, exactly. So you see have a lot of the pseudo inclusion and the cells towards the periphery are elongated and the cells towards the center oh. are more round. So there is variation. Umbrella the cells are present. Umbrella cells are present. Yes. yes, yes. You have umbre no, umbrella cells. Yeah, exactly. That is also a very good pointer. You have some umbrella cell like the flattened cells are here present in the periphery. And you see you have, we have a lot of cytoplasm in the peripheral cells, very prominent intranuclear inclusion. And you have some groups. And so there is a variation in the nuclear size and safe, which is present, which is usually not present in the next picture. If I show you for any of the trainee, any of the resident, what is this? Von Bruns nest or nested variant, nested subtype of urothelial carcinoma? And just give attention to this area, this area. There are two things happening here. What are these cells? This bigger cell, which is a very big nucleus. This cell also. So the nested, nested uh, uh, this is a, yeah, this is the nested <laughs> subtype of urothelial okay. carcinoma yes. along with carcinoma in situ. Yes. Okay. So then we have the cystitis glandularis. It's an, this nest has a composed of layers of urothelial cell without ATP, no true glandular differentiation. But what you see, you see this big space with secretion, and the differentials are nested and the micropapillary urothelial carcinomas. So this is cystitis glandularis, the usual type with the glands, and it has intestinal metaplasia with the goblet cell. So this is et intestinalis. And when you do stains, nobody really does stain for it. These are keratin-7 positive. Now we are not using CK7. These are my old slides, so I did not change it. I'm sorry for that. So we do not use the word CK anymore 
in the pathology world, we say keratin 7 and keratin 20 for any keratin or pan keratin and keratin 5 by 6. And these are CDX2 and CK20 negative. I mean, keratin 20 negative, but if you have this goblet cell, they are positive for CDX2, keratin 20, and the negative for keratin 7. And they're beautifully positive for music armin and alcyon blue. Then comes squamous metaplasia. Like any other organ, it could be non-keratinizing squamous metaplasia or keratinizing squamous metaplasia with parakeratosis. Non-keratinizing squamous metaplasia is present in about 85% of women in the reproductive age group and 75% of menopausal women, particularly in the trigone area. And it is the most common normal finding in a women in the trigone. Occurrence outside the if it is away from the trigone in the dome or in the lateral wall, anterior wall, posterior wall, then posterior lateral wall, then you think about metaplastic change. It may cause urinary urgency, frequency, a pseudomembranous trigonitis, trigonitis, or but there is no risk of cancer. Also seen in male receiving hormonal therapy for okay. prostate cancer. When the uh, when the prostate cancer patients they undergo therapy with androgen deprivation therapy, they do so these kind of changes I in the money. blood. Uh, then, uh, Upashna, could you please uh, mute everyone? Yeah. So the next come the histology. So squamous cells, they have a bubbly appearance due to accumulation of glycogen that produce the cytoplasmic clearing. Then it could be keratinizing if it's a long-standing mucosal irritation because of a diverticular, cystosomiasis, catheterization, bladder stone, or there are multiple kidney stones which are getting out in the urine, damaging the bladder wall. You see this keratinization and parakeratosis. And is more common in patients with spinal injury or paraplasia. We have we've been uh, bedridden for a long time, and you have hyperkeratotic paraglotic squamous epithelium. Yes. Can be associated with concurrent or subsequent okay. cancer. Okay. Then this is an important entity, nephrogenic adenoma. So what is nephrogenic adenoma? When you the name itself is very important. Adenoma means there is a glandular proliferation, which is possibly benign or tumor-like, and nephrogenic means it is derived from the renal tubules, not from the bladder. But what are they doing in the bladder wall? So nephrogenic adenoma, usually it can involve the entire urothelial tract, most commonly the bladder and the urethra, where they form submucosal nodular masses, which are tan red to red in color on cystoscopy. So what are they? They are papillary structures or they're tubular structures or their round tubular structure is hobnailed epithelium, and they are usually infiltrative in the lamina propria. They're composed of numerous small as well as cystically dilated tubules with plump vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli, hobnailing, mitosis are rare. And when you see something like this, what are the differentials? I'll show you another picture also. Let me know. So if you see these pictures, tubular glandular pattern, Pseudo, they're infiltrated, they have hobnailed, they can have fibromyxoid stroma. So what are the things you do? Uh, what are the differentials of nephrogenic adenoma when you have this sort of gland in the bladder wall, which are infiltrated? What are the histologic mimic of nephrogenic adenoma? Because you do not really need immunostain for nephrogenic adenoma. What are the three close mimics, histologic mimics of nephrogenic adenoma? Is a gland forming lesion or acinar lesion. So I think about a glandular no, subtype. Adenoma is you know, what did you say? Prostatic so adenocarcinoma. Yes, adenoma. Prostatic, prostatic, adenocarcinoma, prostatic adenocarcinoma is a very good bet. Next one. Yeah, adenocarcinoma. adenocarcinoma of the bladder, yes. Vesical adenocarcinoma, number three. You see yes, this hob name. Adenomyoma. Hob no, adenomyoma is not a differential because we do not have anything supporting it. Then clear cell carcinoma. Somebody said clear cell. Yes, very good. Clear cell carcinoma of the bladder is a differential. Yes, very good. So these three are the top three differentials of a nephrogenic adenoma. Who said clear cell? 
sir me and again sir nested variant of urothelial carcinoma also yes nested is nested with central cystic change is yes, also sir. uh yes like here it looks like a nested subtype so nested subtype of urothelial adenocarcinoma of the bladder are coming from somewhere else prostatic acinar adenocarcinoma low lesion and clear cell carcinoma of the bladder but what you see in basically in these lesions the cells they look alike there is no nuclear atypia number one number two even if they are infiltrative you do not see any mitosis or necrosis or retraction surrounding these structures retraction is a feature of invasion in bladder pathology that is not there again the overlying urothelium looks normal number three and the most important thing what you are going to call for to the clinician is any history of stone or instrumentation why so nephrogenic adenoma commonly occurs in the setting of prior urothelial injury and it may represent metaplastic changes in the urothelium. So what you see, these are basically set out cells from the renal tubules and they harbor and make a mass-like structure or a mass-like formation in the bladder wall. This is not, so bladder is only giving space, is like a hostel. So they are staying in bladder, but they are coming from the and nephrogenic adenoma, clear cell carcinoma of the bladder, urothelial and prostatic, they are the nested urothelial and prostatic are close mimic. If you see, this is a nephrogenic adenoma, which is derived from the renal tubule and it is positive for S100A1, which is a nucleocytoplasmic stain. It is also positive for PAX2 and PAX8, which are negative for these entities. It is also positive for human kidney injury molecule 1 is negative for all three. We basically do not need any stain in this condition. It's a morphologic, but for the sake of the class, I picked some for my old research study from 2011. And this is Amacar or S image, which is also positive in nephrogenic adenoma. And, but one thing is if you see only Amacar, which can be positive in all four, so it is going to confuse. So if you have to choose two stain, the best bet would be a PAX-8 or a PAX-2, which stains nephrogenic adenoma and is negative in the rest of the thing. Or you put a GATA-3 just to rule out a bladder and an absin for a clear cell cancer. Then comes urothelial hyperplasia. So when you say now urothelium is with only four to seven cell thick without cytologic atypia. So when it is with, and there is lack of a fibrovascular core. So here it is kind of little normal urothelium with a fibrovascular core. The thickness is two, three layers. Here is the thickened urothelium, but there is no fibrovascular core to call it a papilloma, pun lump, or a cancer. Then what you see, the base of this lesion shows increased vascularity and diffuse papillomatosis can also occur, but papillary urothelial hyperplasia is something where what you see is an intact urothelial layer. The lining is never beyond seven cell. There is absolutely no cytologic atypia. And what you see in the bottom, you see a lot of vessels. So do not tend to call it, overcall it. And there is no fusion among the papilla. So do not try to overcall it as a low-grade papilla urothelial carcinoma or a pannum. It can be associated with inflammation, stones, and other things. So we'll just get into the details. Now the polyps, non-neoplastic benign condition. Let's have some questions. I mean, anybody has any questions so far? Then I get into the polyps and non-neoplastic benign conditions. Anybody has any question? So which book to read? Huh? Which book to read? Uh, Dr. Epstein, I would say Dr. Epstein's um, bladder biopsy interpretation book, Jonathan Epstein's, that is a good book uh, to start with. That, that, has, that is going to make your concepts very, very clear. Uh, hello, Sambisar, Manas here. Uh, uh, hi, Manas. Yeah, uh, tell me. So just I wanted to know the regarding the uh, case that you showed that uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, follicular carcinoma having granuloma uh -huh. 
showing granuloma huh. it was a part of routine workup or it's a known case or something like how how it was i mean looking... we, uh, no the thing is uh, it was it was a known case of follicular thyroid carcinoma and there was a bladder nodule patient presented with hematuria so they walked it up but we had the history of follicular carcinoma when we received the trbt chips it was Quite forming uh, nodules huh? quite so scary we, actually ha huh, scary we had the history so that made our life very very easy because we had the history of follicular thyroid carcinoma in that patient uh, followed by um, these nodules on the urothelial mucosa thank you okay so let's start with the polyps non neoplastic benign conditions so the first thing is a friend a fibroepithelial polyp which can occur virtually at any site you have this edematous loose myxoid stroma sometimes you see this um, atypical cells also inflammation is virtually absent lining is usually flat very rarely you see hyperplasia and no atypia no loss of polarity no mitosis no necrosis you can you will see the epithelium all around in case of fibrocellular polyp multinucleated giant cells are not rare they are commonly seen in the stroma of fibroepithelial polyp then endocervicosis it is an uncommon glandular tumor like conditions of the bladder what you see you see this fibrotic stroma like that of cervix and is usually in the posterior wall of the dome of the bladder they have irregularly appearing mildly atypical atypical mean they mostly show this reactive sort of atypia with school of fish appearance with every cell having little nuclear enlargement and nucleoli and they look uh, as if they are from the same family and you have and they have a basally placed nucleus and a pyical mucin occasional cystically dilated glands and the stroma has smooth muscle and lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate then more common is the endometriosis where you see endometrial gland mostly the endometrial glands are in the proliferative and the inactive states if you are like lucky some very rarely you do see secretory endometrium which is a functional endometriosis and you have this round endometrial cell which is most common site in the urinary tract among all the urinary organs females from 25 to 30 years following pelvic surgery presence of endometrial gland and stroma then the sidrophages and the differential within adenocarcinoma the stromal cells you really do not need any stains because you see this cuffing but if you are in doubt you can go for stains like cd10 keratin 7 and all so if i may ask a question what entity if you have endometriosis of the bladder what entity you should have in your mind as a, because endometriosis is a precursor lesion for that lesion that tumor if you have extensive endometriosis of the bladder what you would alert to your urologist if you have extensive endometriosis anyone what are the endometriosis associated cancers amulerian cancers you do see those kind of cancers in the bladder like endometrial uterine endometrial like adenocarcinomas or endometrial have, carcinoma ha and ha endometrial type adenocarcinoma not the regular endometrial and clear cell carcinoma of the bladder then comes this is something called what are this stuff 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 this is amyloid this is a cellular eosinophilic substance which is present compressing the blood vessels so this is the amyloid and in normal aging you do see the lipofuscin pigment and sometimes this is a case of adriamycin toxicity you have this brown black pigment sticking to the umbrella cells then what are changes you should look in the epithelium and the subepithelial tissue when we think about a met hyperplasia metaplasia dysplasia and a cancer i already discussed about it loss of polarity and isonucleosis irregular nuclear envelope these are the key to call something a in situ cancer or a dysplasia and when they invade it is carcinoma which is not entirely true for bladder because even if it is not invasive it still can be a cancer 
So normal cell undergoing the smooth nuclear membrane, inconspicuous nucleoli, homogeneous appearance, getting into an isonucleosis, irregular nuclear membrane, nucleolar prominence, mitosis, convolutions, multipolar mitosis and stratification, and loss of groove is a feature of cancer. Then architecturally, if I cut a papilla like this, you have a papillary core here and the cells here. If I cut it end on, or longitudinally, you have the papillary core here. So either way, you have to imagine the papilla. Then if it is a hyperplasia, the layering is less. Papilloma, the layering is more, but they are resumented. They respect each other, and there is no loss of polarity. But here, if you see some cells are parallelly oriented, some are making angle, and some are perpendicularly. So there is loss of polarity with increased cell layer. So we'll start with the urothelial papilloma. What is, it's about less than a percent of total urothelial tumor. It is very rare. Most common site is the lateral and the posterior wall in the anterior and trigone. You probably do not get papilloma. So knowing about the site is very important in, uh, before looking at a two RBT, they usually have small solitary lesion with one or more delicate fibrovascular core line by cytologically and architecturally normal cells. The usual cell layer is five layer. It can go up to seven also. No mitosis, delicate fibrovascular core with edema, no fusion of the papilla. You see this is fragmented core. Then this core usually have some tonic inflammatory cells and macrophages. Um, in the topmost umbrella cell layer, you can see ATPI again that you do not you basically you discount the umbilical cell, sorry, the umbrella cells when you, I'm sorry for that, um, umbrella cell when you look into the rest of the urothelium and other changes like vacillation, cytologic ATP and mucinous change. Then this is an inverted papilloma. Who is going to describe this lesion? I have already um, said that in the group. One of the training. So here, if you see, this is the normal urothelium. And what is happening? There is an endophytic proliferation. And if you see carefully, the endophytic proliferation are joining with each other. They're arborizing, but the wall, the thickness of the lining is still less. It is very less. It's like three, four layer probably. And here also. So it's a benign urothelial tumor with an invasive, uh, sorry, inverted growth pattern or inward growth pattern or endophytic growth pattern. No cytologic ATPR. And this is like a vessel in the core, and this is another vessel. So if you see, you do see some cytologic ATP. It is not entirely correct that no cytologic ATP, but the cells are perpendicular aligned to the vessel in the center. I have another good diagram uh, here. So the key features you see this invaginating pro prolif polypoid proliferation and astromosing cords and tubercle. So if you see in the, so what is happening? They are like cords which are two layers, cell layer thick. If it is more than that, they're more like tubercle. They're joined with each other and with some thin cords as well. And the stroma is edematous. Then central streaming of the urothelial cell. What do you mean by central streaming of urothelial cell? This is like this picture. If you see the cells in the center of the papillae, they are kind of perpendicular to, or I would say they're rather pa parallel to each other and the stream around these vessels. This just have this picture. This is this juxtaposed nuclei making a stalk one after the other is the central streaming of the vessel. No exophytic component that there is nothing into the bladder wall. And if you talk to the urologist, he will say there is nothing inside the bladder wall, but it's more like a submucosal lesion. And it is characterized by small, uniform, bland nuclei and no mitosis. This is the typical central streaming of the nuclei, if I have to tell you this kind of nucleus. They look like endocrine cells. And you do see some abrupt atypia, like big polyhedral cells and multinucleation. So the differentials of this is important. You can have endophytic growth pattern of a punlum. 
So how to differentiate the endopathic growth pattern of a papilloma or a pannulum from an inverted papilloma? In inverted urothelial papilloma, you see central streaming and peripheral palisading and uniformly thickened and expanded cords of cells which are going inward. Endophytic growth pattern can be seen in high-grade and low-grade urothelial carcinoma. In that case, you will have an exophytic structure present, presence of high-grade nuclear features like pleomorphism and isokaryosis, nucleoli, lots and lots of mitosis, lamina propria invasion, and you do not have this thin cores, rather you have thick cores, and the cores are joined with each other, making a very deceptive look of a solid island or a gland. Then... Uh, you have irregular distribution. In paraganglioma, what you see, you see is rounded nests of cells, but the paraganglioma will show more variation in the nuclear size, and in case of doubt, you do your stains, like synaptophysin, chromogranin, and paraganglioma is also positive for GATA3 and ISL1. Von Bruns nest will have a lobular growth pattern. You can make a lobule, and it is usually not an endophytic lesion, and they do not see this palisading and streaming. Carcinoid is again has a nested trabecular racinar architecture and they have a very specific salt and pepper chromatin pattern. Then comes a tubular villus adenoma. It is like the tubular villus adenoma of the GI tract. So any questions so far? I am the only one who is speaking. I just I want participation from the students and the trainee. Uh, uh, Upashna, you can unmute everyone so they can start asking questions. Sir, can you please again explain the streaming pattern? Yeah, sure. Definitely. I was expecting that. That's a difficult concept. So let me just go back. Thank you for asking. So if you see here, this one, this is the central fibrovascular core. This one and some this one. So if you see the stacks of nuclei, which are kind of next to each other here, they look like what? Secretory endometrium, right? Or there is like a line of nuclei, very uniform looking. This is one. And here also you see some groove. Yes. Then if I get into the other picture, one is streaming and the other one is palisading. Okay, so streaming and palisading are basically used very, very interchangeably among all of us in the GU community. It is unlike your uh, skin, the people who, who do um, skin cancers, uh, like basal cell carcinoma and all, we kind of use streaming and palisading more interchangeably and more in a synonymous way. Like here also, in this picture, if you, if you, see, these are all from one case. So once I see this thing, what I first, what is going to cut my attention first is you have an urothelium which is of normal thickness or less in thickness, a thinned out, but there is an endophytic proliferation and there is no ATP on the topmost layer. And when you see endophytic proliferation, it is difficult for me how they are connected with each other. They are like kind of, it is very difficult where it begins. And we know it is beginning from here, but where it ends, they are all interconnected to each other. The, their thickness is either two cell or more than three cell, but it's never more than four, five cells. And if you see the periphery part or the just next to the vessel, they are streaming or they are palisading. Like here, it is also sort of palisading. If I see this one, it is also making palisades, right? Palisades of nuclei. So that is a feature of, and you do see this ATPR, but pay attention to the groove, absence of mitosis, and the cell, wall th cell layer thickness. These are not basically fused papilla. This is interanastomosing papillae or interconnecting papillae or interconnecting cords and trabecule making the entire lesion. Is it clear? Okay, sir. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Sir, Dr. Deepika is asking how to differentiate the inverted papilloma from von hmm. Bruns nest. Okay, that's a great question. So when you say von Bruns nest, von Bruns nest is again, you do not see a broad lesion. The von Bruns nest, what you see, the nests are larger in size. They do not show trabeculation or cord-like changes. They are more round in structure. 
picture they are not tubercular and if you draw a circle in for both the cases you can draw a circle but if you see a lot of stroma edema roundness of the lobules or the roundness of the nest unlike more tuberculated cord like structures or the papilla what you see in inverted papilloma and the fibrovascular cores are absent in von Brun's nest in von Brun's nest the cells are perfectly round you do not see the elongated cells in the periphery with palisading and streaming and um, there's a lot of stroma is it clear yes sir okay thank you any more question Just remember one thing, paragangliomas can be muscle invasive. Paragangliomas can be muscle invasive and the treatment for that is again cystectomy. But in paragangloma, if you have a question, uh, in paragangloma between a high grade lesion or a paragangloma, basically go for stain. GATA3 is positive in both bladder tumor and also urothelial cancers and in paragangloma, so it doesn't really help. Your neuroendocrine markers, and this S100 staining the periphery of the nest in a sustentacular pattern helps to differentiate these lesions. What do you do now? And again, the typical, what is the typical history of a paraganglioma? What history you want to extrapolate or to Hypertension. get Hypertension. Uh, but how, what is what the urologist is going to tell you when they're removing the uh, uh, two RBT chips? What is the typical Intraoperative hypertension. Intraoperative hypotension. Not oh, hypertension. Hypertension. Uh, when they have hypertension. So drop in the blood pressure during uh, uh, during the surgery. Or fluctuation in the blood pressure in, during the surgery. Okay. So flat lesions of the bladder. Sorry, sir. Huh, Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, can we have uh, a papillary urothelial neoplasm uh, okay. if the layering is less than... Um, um, say about not uh, seven or uh, eight. But kind what of, is what uh, is the ATP? What is the degree of ATP? ATPI is significant. Yes. ATPI is so significant for if the ATPI is, is significant, then you don't care about the layering. Okay. Huh. If the ATPI the... is significant, you see mitosis, and the ATPI is true ATPI. I mean, every single cell will look different from each other, and you see uh, a lot of karyorectic debris, and uh, Unless, uh, once you see ATP, a uh, moderate to severe ATP uh, with mitosis, even if the layering is two layer, you're still going to call it as a, we call it a cancer. Yeah, because um, uh, the, we had uh, uh, similar cases. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, the layering were uh, less, but the significant ATP uh, mitosis with a lot of branching and all. Yes. So... Uh, we uh, can still the, have, right? Uh, exactly. Because what happens when you see, look into the bladder biopsy, so first of all, in the low power scanning, uh, we see like whether it is uh, the lining is like thickened or it is papillary and um, what is it? So if you do not see any atypia, well, if you do not see any atypia and it's just very, very regular urothelium, but the lining is more and there is papillary formation. So you call it as a papilloma or you say papillary hyperplasia. They are interchangeably used. Some people they call papilloma when I normally when I call when I see this typical picture of a papilloma, I call it a papilloma. For me, if I see something like this, I'll show you in a second. Yeah, if I see something typically like this, then my threshold of calling something papilloma is very, very high. Unless I see something like this, I do not call it papilloma. I need to see this kind of good papillary cores, they are detached from each other and it is not from the trigone, from the anterior and wall. So I need to have the history. I always call them before I call it papilloma because my report has a lot of value for the patient care next time because if I make something wrong, the treatment is going to be wrong because if I see something like this in the trigone, I'll probably cut different labels to see whether there is joining, they are joining with each other or there is something going on. Okay. But in, uh, and for something calling as hyperplasia, uh, where is it? Yes. In a second. Hmm. Yeah. Suppose this is like a flat lesion, but the lining is more. No ATP absolutely. 
no fibrovascular core, just some vessels stuck to the basement membrane. This I'll call a urothelial hyperplasia. It could be flat hyperplasia or a papillary hyperplasia. In these cases, I would not think about pun lump, low grade, high grade, anything. Is it clear, Manos? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's talk about a pap flat lesions with atypia and urothelial dysplasia. Let me tell you one thing. Uh, while we are working on the uh, last WHO, I was involved uh, with the last WHO, we tried to not to not to overcall, um, no, I mean, avoid this terminology as much as possible. I mean, we usually have pathologists have a tendency to call something as ATP or dysplasia and not committing what is it. But that is probably not good in bladder pathology. I'll tell you in a minute. So this is something, this one, this one, and this one. So let's talk about this. So what is this? The lining is flat. It is not more than five or six cells layer. So what is this one? Any one of you. Atypia. Yeah, this, this is all atypical. Everything, everything. Reactive, ch reactive changes. It can okay. be reactive atypia. Sir. Yeah, reactive it could, changes. Yeah, it, was, it could be reactive also. Very good. So it could be reactive or it could be CIS. How about this one on the right? Mostly CIS. It is CIS. Why? If you see, let's start with this one. Let's see the nucleus. Let's see the nucleus. This is a flat lesion. Okay. Try to avoid the word urothelial dysplasia. Okay. I'll tell you in a minute why. So if you see here, you have this nuclei. The orientation is lost. So just pick one nucleus. Whether nuclear membrane is irregular, the size of the nucleus is more than six times that of the lamina propria lymphocyte. Mm -hmm. And the nucleoli are not visible. They are present, but probably here it is visible, but it is not conspicuous here. And the chromatin is very, very dark and smudgy. So this is a typical CIS. And what happens in case of CIS, the underlying stroma gives a lot of reaction by vascular congestion. This is what is happening. And the CIS is extending from the bottom and involving the umbrella cell layer. But if you see this one, is it reactive or CIS? This is reactive or CIS? It's just hypoplasia. This is hyperplastic. Okay, lining is more. But do you, are you worried about this epithelium? Are you worried? You have a good umbrella cell layer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, from the bottom, if you go up here, the bottom is very, very hyperchromatic, smudgy chromatin, and all these things. Some basal cell layer is there, but mostly it is the process is going from the bottom to the top. But here, if you look at this bunch of nuclei, are they looking atypical to you? I mean, they look a little enlarged with nuclear prominence, but are they yeah, look alike or they look different? Typical. What did you say? They yeah. Don't look. Uh, they look. They look a little enlarged, nuclear megaly with nuclear prominence, but are they pleomorphic? But they are not pleomorphic. They are not aligned. Yes, very good. They are not aligned to perfectly to the basement membrane. They are kind of making a bunch of nuclei, one place and the other with some cell nucleus, nuclei free zone. But the nuclear chromatin is alike. Is there anisocaryosis? And as my question is, anisocaryosis is present or not? No, no, no sir. and the nuclear membrane is smooth. Yes. So this is a perfect yes. picture of school of fish appearance or they belong to the same family in yes, a reactive yes. ATPR. Okay. Okay. Like if you if I take this thing and put it in the endometrium, you will say what? Reactive syncytial metaplasia, right? 
if i cut this yes. and put it in the endometrium there is reactive sensitivity mm -hmm. and another important thing for reactive change is the clear cell change when you see so much of clear cell change vacillated change inter epithelial edema preservation of the uh, this reactive looking umbrella cell you stay away from calling something as a cis or dysplasia it is a reactive what about this one jaldi jaldi kar lo what is this one upashna you want to take it what what is happening here is it this ugly or this much innocent and banal looking you tell me what is happening here any one of you how are you going to sign it up this case you do not have any immunostain so, in your lab so orientation of uh huh orientation, orientation of basal cell is maintained yes very good uh, and only the superficial cells are looking hyperchromatic mm -hmm. but uh, but variation of the nuclear chromatids and isokaryosis size is variable but uh -huh. an isokaryosis is not not That's there much. but the uh, nesocaryosis is not there you are correct but if you see the cells are very very hypochromatic like yes, uh, yes sir uh, here like like if you see this cell and this cell they are they are very very dark and blue yeah ha uh, but it is not matured like this and the nuclear size is probably not like 5 6 times that of lamina propria lymphocytes is probably 2 3 times so how yes, you are going sir. to sign it up are you going to call it reactive atp or cis Sir, I will go with reactive ATP only. In this, it's not CIS, sir. What about this? This is reactive ATP in the center. This is CIS. So because once you say reactive ATP, the patient is going to be out of the hook from the oncologist, and the patient might develop something later on. So thus, think in that way. If you say reactive ATP, no follow-up tube RBT or cystoscopy or a urine cytology is going to be done. So flat ATP. displacement yes you will sign out probably this is a good case for dysplasia because what you see you see the abnormality is there but it is not that pronounced like a cis you have some hyperchromasia but the basal cell is maintained but you do not see the typical school of fish appearance or the syncytial appearance of a reactive atp there is no clear cell change but some cells are trying to drop out and becoming very very hypochromatic however the cell size is does say size is smaller than the cis so you would probably write this report as flat urothelial dysplasia comma c comment and in the comment you write down all the morphologic feature and ask for immunostain but immunostain is basically not available a lot of places so how the immunos is going to help you who is going to tell me what is euro 3 cocktail how immunostain is going to help in this scenario if at all it is available in your in your lab but believe me cis is a histopathic histologic diagnosis it doesn't need an immunostain unless you think about cis and histology you would not diagnose it and these lesions are usually seen when the layering is low it is two three layers and is denuded out so how immunostain is going to help you in differentiating a cis and a reactive atp from um, from I mean, cis from reactive atp The, your umbrella cell, as I said, the umbrella cell stains by keratin twenty. Keratin twenty stains the umbrella cell, and the rest of the layers are negative for keratin twenty. So if you see your entire thing is keratin twenty positive with loss of CD forty four, which is an adhesion molecule, it and provided you have the appropriate morphologic context. In the appropriate morphologic context, if there is full thickness keratin twenty staining with loss of cd44 and if you are lucky you see a mutant type of diffuse tp53 staining you are dealing with a dysplasia/cis not a reactive atp and this table has all the features what i just mentioned okay is it useful yes sir yes sir okay yes sir Let's go to the next one. It's an urothelial tumor. It is a neoplasm with urothelium lining the papillary fronts. 
And just remember, there is nothing called papillary dysplasia or papillary CIS. CIS is a flat lesion and the present at red erythematous areas on cystoscopy. A neoplasm with a urothelium. In the previous picture, uh, this you will probably call your urologist and ask for a repeat URBT. I would not waste my, uh, money, the patient's money on doing stains. Rather, the patient should undergo a repeat URBT to look for any high-grade lesion because if there is extensive CIS, that would call for an intravesical BCG followed by follow-up and probably eventually the patient would need a radical cystectomy. So it is a neoplasm with urothelium lining the papillary fronts, a predominant disorderly architectural pattern and moderate to marked architectural and cytologic atypia. So in the 2022, if you have, uh, we have benign lesion, I'm not a big proponent of panlam. I try to, the way I was trained with Dr. Epstein and Dr. Amin, uh, both of them, they avoid the word panlam because once you say panlam, the patient may or may not come for a follow-up. So I kind of always, if I am clear, it is not a benign lesion, I overcall them as low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma so that the patient would be followed up um, regularly and uh, would not, uh, we can basically avoid an erroneous thing beforehand. Then it is your squamous cell carcinoma, which can be usual verrucous, basal or sarcomatoid, adenocarcinoma and the mixed type. So what is papillary urothelial neoplasm of low malignant potential? As you said, it's a low grade papillary neoplasm and is a low grade tumor. So it is a low grade papillary tumor with papillary architecture or a low-grade papillary urothelial tumor, it has an exophytic growth pattern like urothelial papilloma with increase in the thickness, but there is very minimal ATPR. So this is a this is a catch. What is minimal ATPR? But why it is important? There is a recurrence rate of 60%. Low-grade and panlam, they recur more, but they progress less. This is very important. When I talk about the dual universe of Bladder cancer, high grade, they progress very fast. They probably, the recurrence rate is low. They progress and metastasize. Whereas the low grade lesions like papilloma, sorry, papillary urothelial carcinoma of low malignant potential and low grade urothelial cancers, they have a very high recurrence rate with low progression rate. So how important is it to report PANLAM? Who is, let's, let's have a debate on this. How often you guys report pan lump? Are you like to report more pan lump to save, your, uh, to save yourself or you want to commit to a low-grade papillary urothelial cancer? Because all of you must be signing out bladder biopsy is very common. Anyone? So we usually avoid using pan lump. Yes. Why? Yeah, now the entire world is moving in that way. Avoid the was panlam because the main reason is the patient should not should a patient should come for a follow up. Yeah, he will Unless, lose to the follow up. Uh, the patient will lo lose to follow up, and secondly, um, if there is a low grade cancer, it will recur more and more. Then it is difficult to know what is minimal, what is mild ATPR. Then invasive urothelial carcinoma, um, which is, um, it could be the based on the degree of anaplasia and architectural features, they are divided into low grade and high grade. So if you say low grade tumor, so low grade tumor is, you have an orderly arrangement of urothelium, but there is very minimal fusion of the papilla and mild, I would not say minimal, you have loss of polarity and papillary fusion, mild complexity, nuclear groups may be present in the basal layer, if you see, not in the middle layer. The nuclear chromatin will change from the basal to the top layer and the top layers become more round with nucleolus. And if at all you see mitosis, they are usually basally located, not going up. Another important thing uh, for low grade, the papilla is really broad. And you do not see the small stocks of papilla, what we saw in the papillomas. And what percentage of high-grade features is 
allowed in a low grade tumor in a low grade papillary urothelial carcinoma what percentage of moderate to severe atpi is allowed up to 5% if you see less than 5% high grade areas in a low grade papillary urothelial cancer you will report it as a low grade papillary urothelial carcinoma with less than 5% high grade area and the patient needs follow up because in the follow up what they do they do a urine cytology and they look into the bladder wall by cystoscopy and if, if they see anything abnormal they take it out in the follow up cystoscopy then high grade you see markedly enlarged nucleus either moderate to severe atypia chromatin would be coarse with variation in the chromatin texture lot of mitosis, nucleoli, and it is a no-brainer diagnosis regardless of the thickness of the lining. So lining thickness doesn't really come into picture when you have a high-grade urothelial cancer, papillary urothelial cancer. Then if I have to differentiate these three, pan lump would have a delicate papillae, they are rarely fused, Low grade would be fused, but to some extent, and high grade would be more branched, fused, and sometimes they can be they can show tertiary branching. Organization polarity would be normal. It can be of any thickness, and cells are more cohesive. Here, the cells are more crowded, with presence of nuclear groove occasionally in the basal layer. As they go up, they lose the nuclear groove and the vacillation, and there is presence of mitosis in the basal layer with mild crowding and pleomorphism. Importantly, for high grade, it can be any thickness, maybe a single cell of denuding cell will make it a high grade tumor. And these are the other features. Chromatin is very important to differentiate low and high grade. If you see, there is variation in the chromatin texture. One cell having finely dispersed chromatin, other having coarsely clumped chromatin with prominent nucleoli, marked variation in the nuclear size and safe, irregular to the nuclear membrane, then you are not dealing with a low-grade lesion. You're dealing with a high-grade cancer. The chromatin is usually very fine in pan lump and they look alike, you see some clumping to fine chromatin in low-grade tumor. Nucleoli are usually not visible in pan lump. Actually, none of the pan lump case reported till date, they have nucleoli. Once I see nucleoli, it is not pan lump. I am at a low grade at least. And mitosis are not present. Then what are the histologic subtypes or the variants of urothelial carcinoma? Who is going to tell me? What are the histologic subtypes of urothelial carcinoma? Anyone? What is happening here in the section in the picture six? Picture 6 is a small cell carcinoma. There is CIS in the urothelium and below that there is a small cell carcinoma. And 3 has clear cell. 2 is, what is 2? It is micropapillary. You have this space and this glandular and the papillary structures. Number 5 is sarcomatoid. It looks like a spindle cell tumor. 8 is lymphoepithelial. It is like an azopharyngeal cancer. What you see, you have a syncytial, um, there are a lot of nuclei in one cytoplasmic background, which is pink with a prominent nucleoli and a lot of lymphocytary stroma. Then it has osteoclastic giant cell rich cancer. Then you can have gland forming tumor, which is in four. And what is here? It is probably non creatinizing squamous with the urothelial. What is this again gland? Then muscular is propria invasion. And this Sir, is a sarcoma. Question. Sure. Sir, uh, we can have a signet ring morphology as well. For yeah, the... we can have yolk sac like, <clears throat> we can have signet ring. Dr. Suvashis is going to show you a lot of cases in the next class, so I'm not covering it. So you can have signet ring, you can have trophoblastic, uh, syncytial giant cells. Uh, you can have areas like, I have a case I'll show you in clear cell in a minute. Then uh, you have this York sac like differentiation of cellular dual bodies. These are different morphologies. And this is, what is this? What is the diagnosis here? Is muscle invasive, but what is the diagnosis? 
it looks like a sarcomatoid urothelium right. Right. yes and how about this one is extensive squamous differentiation squamous. yes and we have yes. this retraction oh. Oh. then you can have adenocarcinomas mucin adenocarcinoma is signatory mucin. type uh, adenoid cystic type pattern hepatoid pattern so what is the role of immunohistochemistry to establish the urothelial origin at a metastatic tumor, whether it is coming from the bladder or not, you need IHC. And GATA3 is a fairly good stain, and we can have uroplakin 2 to distinguish reactive from CIS, to assist the staging of bladder cancer, <clears throat> to distinguish various spindle cell lesions of the bladder, and to rule out a metastasis to the bladder from elsewhere. From elsewhere. So this we will kind of go over when you get into the case, but very, very essential. The important thing you need to remember when you have a tumor, high-grade tumor in the bladder neck, the differentials are a prosthetic asner adenocarcinoma and a urothelial carcinoma because they look alike when they are very high-grade in the bladder neck. What happens? Prostate cancer, even if it is very high grade, it has it retains its monotonous look. The cell border is usually very, very thin and they have an amphophilic to clear cytoplasm. The bladder tumors, they are usually pleomorphic. They show extreme degree of pleomorphism, squamous metaplasia, and prominent nucleoli with variation in the marked variation of nucleosides. Bladder tumors are positive for GATA3 and uroplakin, whereas the prostate tumors, the high-grade prostate cancers, just remember one thing, high-grade prostate cancer, they often lose out prostate-specific antigen. They're usually PSA negative, but the best tend to pick a high High-grade prostate cancer is NKX 3.1. I think in Odisha, a lot of lab, they're having NKX 3.1, if I'm not wrong. And you can use androgen receptor and prostate-specific membrane antigen. NKX 3.1 is fairly good. Then, as I said, in um, by doing this stain, we already discussed. Can you just give me one second? Hello? So, CK20 is limited to the umbrella cell in normal and also in reactive ATP. It increase in the deeper layer and full thickness in CIS. P53 is absent in the normal and reactive. It is positive in dysplasias. And CD44 is lost in dysplasia and CIN because they are adhesion molecule which is lost in high-grade lesions. Then uh, let's go. just skip this one. You all know this, I think. So as you know, in urothelium, it can undergo metaplastic change and which could be squamous, metanephric, intestinal, or it will be just unremarkable urothelium with a flat change, which could be benign or malignant. If it is le more than less than seven layer, it is hyperplasia or papillary lesion. If it is more than seven with ATPR, it could range from anything. And then tumor would be lower, high grade. Then glandular proliferations can be benign or malignant. If it is benign, it could be uracle remnant, ectopic prostatic tissue, endocervicosis, endometriosis, or cystitis glandularis. Malignant could be metastasis or adenocarcinoma primary vesicle or uracle adenos. Then benign cellular proliferation, if it is neutrophil in acute cystitis, lymphoplasma cystic is chronic, lymphoid follicle is follicular cystitis, eosinophilic granulomas, and hemorrhagic cystitis. If it is infection, this is a bunch of infection, we already have seen this. Then if you get into the soft tissue of the bladder, in the soft tissue, you can have benign soft tissue tumors like inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, which is alcoholic lyomyomas, post-operative spindle cell nodule following a 2RBT, hemangiomas and napsy tumor, can be a bunch of malignant vascular tumors and other smooth muscle tumor, melanoma, germ cell tumor, and hemopoietic neoplasms. So this is a schematic diagram. I think Sangeeta has already shown you this during her lecture in, during the APCON in Sambalpur. In Raulkula, sorry, the TIA, this is a TIS, it's carcinoma in situ, it's the TA which is going towards the lumen but no invasion. Getting to the lamina propria is T1, into the inner muscle is T2A, this is T2B, then it's getting out of the peri, into the perivesicular tissue is T3 and adjacent organ or out, it is T4. 
So from 1973 to 2004 and then 22, we are evolved into from a three tier system into a low grade and high grade category. And basically what we do now in a bladder cancer, we don't even say low or high grade, we say non muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer. Why? So this is a dual universe of bladder cancer. So by doing genomic profiling, the bladder tumors are divided into two groups. One is a muscle invasive bladder cancer and a non muscle invasive bladder bladder cancer with specific gene signature. So, and accordingly, they are divided into, I'll just skip this diagram because this is not very useful. So I'll go to a more simplified one. So bladder tumors are divided into three groups now. One is a luminal group, which has expression of FGFR3 and there is a blocker for FGFR3. They are usually low-grade tumor. They have a better overall survival and disease-specific survival than the basal subtype. Then we have something called a P53-like tumor, which has, again, a basal survival, but they're resistant to new adjuvant chemotherapy with platinum. Basal-like tumors, they have poor prognosis. They express the basal-like keratin, like 5, 6, and CK14, and they're resistant to, again, new adjuvant therapy. Then, so accordingly, like breast, they are divided into different type based on the keratin and the GATA3 profile. Then there is P53 like muscle invasive bladder cancer. This is all for muscle invasive bladder cancer. When it is non muscle invasive bladder cancer, they usually recur. They do not metastasize. They are low grade in histology. But if it is a muscle invasive, they can be basal, luminal, or TP53 like tumors. So for basal like tumors, now the therapy is by inhibiting the HER2 new or immune checkpoint blocker like PDL1 because these tumor do not get um, I mean platinum, the cisplatin and carboplatin are not the appropriate drugs for them. So immune checkpoint blockers help. Luminal tumors you can either target the FGFR or HER2. And second and the lastly in uh, why we need to subtype first to achieve an improved understanding of the biology and to stratify these patients with the aim of improving the management based either on the difference in the outcome or response to the therapy. Thank you very much. And I will acknowledge everyone who were there with me for the last 25 years in my journey in pathology from SCB Medical College where I started my passion for pathology to core where I'm working now. And finally, to all the patients who drive my energy and passion for pathology and medicine as a whole. I can take some questions. Sir, what is about the P53 type of bladder? Okay, okay. so TP53 tumors. So TP53, so in a bladder cancer, I'll go to that. So this is basically, if you do a P53 staining, and you see more than 70% of the tumor shows nuclear positivity for TP53, or there is complete absence of TP53 staining, or diffuse cytoplasmic staining for P53. You call them TP53 mutant pattern bladder cancer. These tumors, even if uh, they have a luminal type immunophenotype, like CK7 and... Um, GATA3 positive and a FOXA1, FOXP1 positivity, they show resistance to chemotherapy and they, they usually present with metastasis. So whenever you have a TURBT, now the requests are coming more and more. To, if you have a muscle invasive bladder cancer, your job doesn't stop there. You probably have to do few more markers like a CK56, GATA3, and TP53 to stratify them as basal, luminal, or TP53 type tumor, like the MIBCs, because the therapy and the prognosis are different. And we are also adding a HER2 for all our bladder cancer, just to show like it is HER2 amplified, HER2 overexpressed or not. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, whether to call it subtype or variant, P53 like MIBC subtype or it could be a variant? It is a subtype. No, if, if we do a molecular, if you are doing an NGS or a molecular testing and you saw TP53 mutation, then you said TP53 like variant of MIBC. Variant, what is used only if you, you have proved it molecularly. If you are looking at the IHC level or morphology level, use the word subtype. Okay. 
for any organ okay, system, sir. not only for bladder, for any it organ was, system. Yes, sir. it may be both. Luminal and basal type. No, no, no. Luminal, basal, they're different tumors. No, no, luminal no, no. Consider a subset of luminal, basal tumors. People like my... Yeah, if, uh, huh, exactly, exactly. Yes. Exactly, madam. Yeah. Uh, TP53 positivity can be there with a luminal phenotype or a basal phenotype. And it is actually white type. How is HER2 new interpreted in this case? Uh, we interpret it like the breast cancer. Breast cancer. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The MIBC is PDL1 expression high. Okay. Sir, you have told you have told you have uh, yeah, Told about sarcoidal differentiation. Uh -huh. uh, uh, is there any sarcoma that will develop in the ignite bladder? Yeah, see, when you have a sarcometer de differentiation, the two things we have to say what is the percentage of urothelial and what is the percentage of the sarcometer areas. So, to call it sarcometer de differentiation, you have to show keratin positivity in those areas. I mean, Weak, maybe weak, some positivity. Then the second job of a pathologist is what type of sarcoma? It's a rhabdo, it's a lyo, it is MPNST, synovial, what kind? And these are different from the true sarcomas of the bladder. True sarcomas of the bladder, they, they are very different. They are not basically sarcometer de differentiation from an invasive urothelial carcinomas. Like true angiosarcomas of the bladder, two synovial, they all can arise, but they are very rare. Most of the sarcometer malignancy in the bladder are basically sarcometer de differentiation in a conventional high grade muscle invasive urothelial cancer. And they are they actually respond very well to immune checkpoint blocker because they are usually basal like and they express high PDL1. Okay. So therefore, your percentage of sarcoma de difference and what type of sarcoma, it is very important to tell your oncologist. In normal <laughs> bladder epithelium, if you do P53 staining, I see, uh -huh. uh, it will be negative. It, it will not be negative. You see some positive cell, some negative cell confined to the basal cell layer. Basal cell. The wild okay. pattern is not completely negative. If it is completely negative, then there is a truncation mutation or a deletion mutation involving the TP53 gene. Therefore, the protein is not expressed at all. So complete negative is a null pattern of mutation. Okay. So it should be some positive nuclear, some negative nuclear. Yes, you have you, you, you shown that. You have shown that. So Dr. Rajit has one question. Is sure. there any prognostic markers for uh, urinary bladder carcinoma? Prognostic P53 is a prognostic marker. HER2 is a predictive marker because there's a drug. PDL1 is a predictive marker. FGFR3 is a predictive marker because it used to be a prognostic marker, but now there is, there is a blocker which is FDA approved. So it is again a predictive marker. Because what happens if it is just a prognostic marker, oncologists would not want the patient to spend that amount of money because in India, everything comes from the patient's pocket to do it because it's just a pro because we have good prognostic factors like muscle invasion, high grade histology, P53 positivity. So uh, if there is a molecule or there is a drug available, they would want us to do that then treatment can be given to those patients because the basal-like MIBCs, they do not respond that well to platinum-based chemotherapy, which is usually given for high-grade urothelial carcinomas. And they saw first-line platinum failure. So uh, then PDL one is tested. Uh, and if it is high, uh, if it is positive, then you go for, uh, they basically put these patients into uh, immune chair on uh, patients on immune checkpoint blockers. Sir, uh, yeah. hello? Yeah. Sir, it's your muscle invasive bladder carcinoma. Hmm. Uh, whether it's to mention in the report when we are getting the lamina, uh, sorry, the muscularis propria and we are seeing the invasion, 
Mm. Uh, we are not seeing the invasion. Then whether we should write it is a non-invasive or no. What you write? Whether you it... you write in this way. You write urinary bladder, comma, transurethral resection, colon, new line. You write a high grade urothelial carcinoma. The first line. The second line would be lamina propria invasion is present. The third line present. would be muscularis propria is present. However, is not invaded by the tumor. And the pathologic T stage would be PT one. Yeah, PT one, not uh, A. PT one. Thank you. So, SCC squamous cell carcinoma. Hmm. Uh, when we are getting extensive squam squamous differentiation, uh -huh. whether we should go with TCC with extensive squamous differentiation, obviously that will be the first diagnosis. But hmm. whether primary squamous cell carcinoma is possible from the metaplastic? Yeah, that's uh, a very I good question. That, 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 that's a very good question you asked. I'm glad you asked this um, question because everybody in the wall has the same kind of question. I'm glad. <laughs> so when you see extensive squamous differentiation, so what you write, you write squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, I what how I phrase these reports because we know in India it is very very prevalent to certain area, geographic location in the wall, and squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder is very rare. So what you write, Right, you you write. I write high grade muscle invasive carcinoma with extensive squamous differentiation, comma C comment. In the comment, I write majority of the squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder are squam extensive squamous differentiation in a conventional high grade urothelial carcinoma, yes. and a yes. minor subset of pure squamous cell carcinoma exist. Um, in that way, I just phrase it. And I always call my clinician to tell them, do not think it is, because if, if they treat, treat these patients as squamous cell carcinoma, the treatment, the disease is going to recur. So these patients need a combination chemotherapy of squamous and urothelial carcinoma because the culprit is a urothelium, which has undergo differentiation into a bad differentiation into a squamous phenotype. Is there any IHC marker to differentiate? No, IHC doesn't help. No. GATA3 is going to be positive in squamous in as well as urothelium. PCK556 mm -hmm. would be for both keratin 5 by 6 P40, P63. Squamous and urothelium, they have mm -hmm. very similar or I would say same immunophenotype. Yes. And it is evident. It is clear cut or it is squamous cell. No, even if it is clear cell, squamous cell, I would not clear call it. Is, uh, it is morphologically we can diagnose it is squamous. No, even if that, what is a question which is very valid and we almost struggled for 15 years to find out a magic marker through various studies, but we failed because squamous and urothelium are very, very similar or same in the immunophenotype. Yes. No immunostain is going to differentiate. Mm -hmm. And another important thing, uroplaquin is a marker when the differentiation is there. In high-grade cancer, about 40 to 50% of high-grade urothelial cancers they lose mm -hmm. uroplaquin. It is uroplaquin negative. So, the treatment plan for PANLAP and low grade carcinoma is different? Or yes, it is, there is a that. lot of vari variation across the globe. In Europe and in India, if you say PANLAP, they don't follow up the patient. In the US, if you say PANLAP, they do follow up by doing cystoscopy, but the interval for cystoscopy is more. So, I used to give PANLAM diagnosis when I was in the US. After coming back to India, my threshold for low grade has increased. So I'm I'm giving more and is low basically. So I'm giving, I do not give any PANLAM diagnosis. I give either low or high. So either papilloma or papilloma, it is a low grade papilloma, carcinoma. Papilloma, low grade well, very or clear. high. Yeah, very clear. Because high otherwise grade. the patient is not going to, um, the patient is going to be completely out of the hook. If I don't, okay. they don't follow it up. I asked them, I asked a lot of urologists across the country. How, if I call, the way I communicate, I say, doctor, if I call it a pun lump, how are you going to treat it? If I call it low grade, how are you going to treat it? Okay. Then he said, I'm not going to follow it up. I said, then it has some features of pun lump, some of low grade, but I'm tending more towards low grade because I want this patient to be followed up. To be followed, okay. Uh, Thank you, sir. Sir, one question is in the chat box. Uh -huh. Is the cross artifact or improper sampling of termed chips hmm. is going to affect the identification of lamina LP or a invasive foci of tumor? Let me read the question. Huh? Uh, sir, do cross artifact? Yes, cross artifact, the improper sampling of the two RBT chips lead to difficulty. Yes, if you see a lot of crushing, 
So you mentioned that in report. And um, in some time, what happens is a very crossed out tumor, you may not find good LP or good um, muscularis propria. And sometimes it is even difficult to say it is high grade and low grade. So in that case, immediate TORBT doesn't help. They probably have to wait for two to four weeks or at least a month to go for a repeat TORBT. And that should be discussed with the urologist and in the report. Unless you write down in the comment section, you are going to lose the patient. These questions are very, very valid questions. I'm really impressed. We all face this in a regular life, in a regular day-to-day -day practice. I did not put cases today because already we are talking for like almost two hours. It would be boring. Dr. Suvashis will show good cases next time, but I can still take questions for another nine minutes. Dr. Shuvas is there. Shuvas, do you have any comment? Sir, in case of necrosis, what you report when you get uh, more of necrosis? Mm -hmm. What you suggest to the clinician? Only necrosis or you are getting some urothelial nests? Or just mm -hmm. necrosis? In some cases, sir, uh, more necrosis oh, no. only we get. Mm -hmm. Only necrosis. If I'm getting yes. a lot of necrosis, the first question I ask whether there is a mass or not. And the mass with is mass, with mass. With mass. Huh? The, the type of mass is important. Is a broad-based mass or is a sessile mass? And normally when you have a sessile mass, you do see that infarction kind of necrosis, not the typical coagulative tumor cell necrosis. If I see coagulative tumor cell necrosis, I'm more worried I'm not missing out a high-grade tumor. So I strongly recommend a repeat to RBT when I see a lot of coagulative tumor cell necrosis and not the typical infarction type necrosis. And the tumor cell volume is less because the chances of missing out a high grade urothelial carcinoma is high. And obviously, before that, I do labels. I never do keratin staining if I see a lot of necrosis because the entire necrotic foci is going to be brown. It will confuse me more. Sir, uh, diagnosis of hypoplasia is avoided in trigone. You have said, I think, that. Yes, in if in the trigone area, if you see hyperplasia, yeah, I can have yeah, question. In the posterior and the lateral wall, I. Excuse me. Yes, who are she's? Samit, my excellent presentation. Uh, Thank you. So, just take simple question uh, uroth regarding urothelial dysplasia. Hmm. Actually, you have already mentioned that urothelial dysplasia should not be mentioned, and hmm. WHO highly discourages uh, reporting it to be urothelial dysplasia. Yeah. But sometimes, in uh, cases, we are uh, uh, many, we are seeing cases where uh, there is subtle changes which. Uh, constitute to call it as urothelial dysplasia falling short of CIS. Uh -huh. And uh, we don't have CD44 immunomarker. I mean, so if can you it don't, see... yeah, if, if you do not have CD44, I would say just do a P53 and keratin 20. That helps. Yeah, uh, KI, yeah. is it helpful? I, KI, no. I would not recommend do, uh, doing KI at all in bladder tumor. They can be erroneously positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the uh, thing is, 
for me i mean we have written two big papers almost 12 years ago but i would not do any stain if i have a question of a reactive atp versus d dysplasia versus cis yes. i would not do I'm... any stain in bladder unless it is a metastatic bladder tumor or i have something to prognosticate or predict for diagnosis i would not waste my money on a single immunostain and more about this uh, bladder mucinous adenocarcinoma differentiating it from enteric adenocarcinoma mucinous type is a bit uh, headache unless until you uh, have it a proper mass history. you have a clinical all... history ha huh. is the clinical history oh. of mucinous carcinoma in the colorectum and ic will not be helpful ic uh, is going to the same ic is going to the same so for both the same. yeah 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 that's very fine i tell you and more about this muscle invasiveness whenever uh, there, there is a question from the chat that regarding the cross stati fact mm -hmm. and this cross stati fact is a big uh, challenge for and the every pathologist ha ha every pathologist and uh, and uh, probably we have to write in the report that there is a lot of cross stati fact and the muscle pro proper is not properly way, identified ha. extensive and, cross stati fact uh, rt is recommended yes, after yes, uh, after yes, interval yes, yes. because if they do a re rbt in one or two weeks you will again get the same problem so they have to wait for four weeks sometimes so, three, huh. sometimes what happens or sometimes what happens urologist gives separately deep muscle mm. but that was not actually deep muscle it was a part of this high grade urothelial carcinoma people do confuse that, with that and they said that they said deep huh. body muscle I mean, is involved and so they this... designate they designate huh. as deep they designate. muscle yes huh. but unless yeah. you see the detrusor bundle you can you should not mention you should not right because you should be confused and you say that deep muscle is being invasive and they will cut the whole bladder yeah then the, <laughs> the problem with bladder is a little mistake from our side may not be intentional lead to a radical cystectomy and the urologists just uh, are waiting I... to get the bladder out that is the problem Yes, yes, that's the point. And moreover, uh, for the deep muscles, people, some people do staining, uh, no, but no, I don't no, think no, that no. Uh, uh, staining, uh, staining will be helpful. Uh, thick and muscular is mucosa sometimes. Ah, uh, smooth lining. Yes, uh, uh, thick and muscular is was... mucosa sometimes. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. If Doctor, I mean lectures. Ha, ha, hypertrophy. Yes, hypertrophy. Hypertrophy. Uh. Hypertrophic uh, yes, muscle is muscular mucosa. Versus your muscular is propria. They create problem uh, sometimes. Yes, but yes. Hypertrophic muscular is mucosa are discontinuous bundle. And secondly, <laughs> immunostain doesn't help. The fellow just yes, before yes. my year, Priya was a fellow just yeah. before my year who is an MD Anderson with Dr. Amin. So she did a study and subsequently the second part of the study I was yeah, also yeah. involved. But practically yeah. that stain lost his. clinical utility the smotelin was a very important stain during 2010 12 and I mean, many papers I mean, that the electron when you try to validate more and more we saw probably will go back to morphology yes 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 thank you samit bhai thank you thank you good night thank you sir for sharing beautiful cases स्मूथलीन muscle you write no muscular is propria seen okay sir uh, so thank you friend thank you dr sambit thank you dr uh, bedi am dr under sambit dr sambit we are conducting a genito urinary course also and i have shared the link in the chat uh, those of you are who are interested you can just click on this uh, form and uh, register yourself it is a four month long course and uh, um, it is really helpful you will see the depth uh, in which the sambit goes 
thank you dr bedi thank you everyone and thank you pashna asranti appa and um, thank you, the rest sir. of the group for organizing this and kanak madam and all of you all my teachers all my medical school teacher are there in the group i'm so excited and uh, so we'll have the next lecture by dr suvashis and until then the resident should revise and if you want i can share the powerpoint with you so that people can read let me know uh, uh, upashna yes sir okay thank you thanks a lot bye 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 good night uh, upashna should i end or I think Dr. Bedi, we can end it here. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Yes, Bedi, sir. for helping. We can helping end. Us. Thank you, sir. Perfect. Okay. I like Thank you. This.